Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. <laughs> Where'd you get them? Trash bin? Why should it be like this? I don't know. It's not fair. Yeah, I know. There's nothing that we can do. I don't want to be like this. Me neither. I wish I was like him. I want to be like him. I want to be like him. I want to be like him. Sorry to take so long, dear. Are you ready to go now? I always thought that I wanted happiness, that I wanted joy in life, like that, <laughs> yeah. But in reality, what we really want is contentment. <clears throat> we want to be content in life, and happiness and joy don't necessarily mean that we're content. An airplane pilot was flying over the mountains in flyover land, we'll say Tennessee. And he looks down and he says to his co-pilot, see that, see that lake out there? When I was a kid, I used to sit in that lake in a rowboat and look up and see the planes flying over and think, I'd really like to be flying that plane. Now here I am, looking down on that lake, doing my job, and I'm really thinking, I'd like to be in that rowboat fishing. Contentment can be an elusive uh, pursuit. We think we'll find 
what we find will make us happy, only to find that it didn't work. We can be happy with those new pair of shoes because ours are a total mess. When in reality, that is not what we need it. That's not what we want it. <clears throat> in life in America, we seek out contentment in many, many different ways. <clears throat> we find it when we look at consumer debt. We're not content to live within our means. So we go into debt <clears throat> just to live what we think is just a little bit better. We think we'll be happy if we get that next item. We'll be happy <clears throat> if we get <clears throat> that new piece of jewelry. We get that new tool, not me. <laughs> Jim, that would be Jim, but <clears throat> definitely wouldn't be me. <coughs> Excuse me. If we get that new pet. Um, we think those things are going to bring us happiness. And we go into debt to get that. And what we thought would make us happy begins to make us miserable on the 20th of the month, every month, when you got to pay it and pay it. And we struggle um, to get through there. The advertising industry really helps bring that along. We see the, the ads trying to convince us that we can't possibly be happy unless we have that thing. And tonight, they're spending tens of millions of dollars to put 30 seconds in there to convince us that we need this to be happy. Whether it's we need this new car, we need Budweiser, we need whatever. They're spending millions and millions of dollars just to influence us for 30 seconds. And if that truly made us happy, next year, there'd be no money spent on ads in the Super Bowl. Because everybody would be happy because they're buying all this stuff. So we often take that bait. We think that one more widget is eventually going to be in the garage, getting dusty, that your wife says, throw that stupid thing away. But you're a hoarder, so you never do. <laughs> you never know when I'm going to want that. <clears throat> if you need it, <laughs> you know, Jim knows. And not only that, other things, if it's not consumerism, maybe it's just discontent shown by the mobility. People are very happy when they buy a new house. Okay, When you get that new house and you're all excited. Well, in America, we have a very high rate of mobility. We move quite often. The statistics I read this week from the Realtor Association says that the average person moves 11.7 times in their life. 11.7 times. So that last one, you're homeless because, you know, you get out of the house, but you don't quite get in that 0.7. Um, that's about once every five years that people are moving from one place to another. Some of them may be really good reasons. Maybe you've gotten a better job and you have to move to go there. Maybe it's your extended family and you want to be together again. But oftentimes, in the majority of the time, statistically, people are just moving from one area of the county they live in to another. They want the bigger house. That bigger house is going to make them happy. Elaine and I know that. That was something that went through us in our younger married life, where we went from little old house in East Fort Myers, our first one, to what we thought was the greatest neighborhood that you could have in Fort Myers, and that's the Fort Myers Villas. It was all convenient 
and then after 10 years, something like that, nine, 10 years, oh, we've got to have the bigger house because we've got four kids and we've got to have all this room. And we thought that would make us happy. And in reality, we bought too much house and it made us miserable because we're going back to that debt and the struggles that we paid, um, that we made to pay, <coughs> make that happen. Happiness in relationships. We think that we're going to be happy when we get married. Okay? And I'm talking society in general. <clears throat> we spent our time in high school scribbling the name of our boyfriend or girlfriend down over and over and over again. And we finally marry them. And then in society, we live in a throwaway society, we find that it's hard, that it's a struggle to keep that together, that it's not just all, you know, roses. So what do we do? Hey, I'm gonna be happy if I get another wife and then I can rekindle that, or I get another hub husband. And that's what society is reaching out to. We've got an astonishing rate of divorce We often look to money to find that happiness, that contentment. Enough so that we live in a world that just sues each other left and right because they want to grab some more money, you know. Or we take money we don't have and buy a lottery ticket like I showed a couple weeks ago, thinking that Ah, if we win, that's going to make us happy. Wouldn't mind trying it, but you know, especially if I lived in Bonita Springs this week. <laughs> but oftentimes, you've heard how those lottery winners go on and they struggle. You know, they, they just are not happy in life. It's not where they want to be. <clears throat> How much money is enough money to make us happy? Okay, we're all, most of us are in the age where we know who J.D. Rockefeller is. Okay, he was at that point the richest man in the world. He was asked by a reporter, how much is enough money? Y'all remember the response? Yep just a little bit more than I've got right now, okay? So he was constantly going after happiness that he couldn't achieve by his own definition, because he needed more, he needed more, he needed more. Today we're gonna look at, <clears throat> yeah, that's a little struggling there. If you got your Bibles, it's the fourth chapter of Philippians, chapter 10, through 13. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things <clears throat> through him who strengthens me. <clears throat> In verse 14, which goes after this, can't read it anyway, but I didn't uh, put it in that slide and should have. It says at the end, yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. It was kind of you to share my trouble. <clears throat> Contentment, being satisfied, being pleased, being accepting. <clears throat> oh, a man, yeah, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> Paul, a man who's sitting in prison. 
He's there because of nothing wrong that he really did. He had corrupt officials waiting to put him to death. And doing it over false charges. <clears throat> but yet somehow <coughs> he finds contentment. He says in verse 11, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So Paul was happy here that the Philippian church had sent a financial gift to him. He wants to express his heartfelt thanks, but at the same time, he doesn't want to give the impression that the Lord was not sufficient to take care of every need that he had. And even though it was a difficult situation for him, in verse 14, what we talked about there, that you share in my trouble, you share in my affliction, even though he had been in that difficult situation, he doesn't want the donors to think that he had been discontented before the gift arrived. But he does want them to know that their, generation, their generosity really was appreciated. So he combines his thanks with his valuable lesson on becoming content. If you look at most sermons, most writings about this passage of Scripture, it deals with contentment. <clears throat> it doesn't really deal with that last verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you look at that whole thing, it, it deals with contentment. So we'll look first at what contentment is as Paul describes it, and then how we can grab a hold of it, how we can acquire it. The word contentment in verse 11 comes from the word that means self-sufficient or independent. Back in the day of the Stoics um, <clears throat> that preceded by three centuries here, they took this word and elevated it that it was to be free from all wants and needs. And as it's the chief of all um, virtues. But this philosophy, <clears throat> oh man, excuse me, I'm going to put a throat lozenger in there as well. This is great public speaking, isn't it, you know? Years ago, our senator was mocked because he stopped in the middle of a press conference to take a sip of water. Now I'm going to take it a step further. <clears throat> but this philosophy was marked by a detachment from everybody's emotions and the indifference to the unwelcome changes that bring about life. So it's clearly this is not the sense which Paul meant this word contentment. Since in verse 10, he shows, <clears throat> verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at length you have revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He rejoiced in the Lord when he received this gift. But he did it, if you look at that verse, not as much because he received the money, but because it showed the Philippians' heartfelt love and concern for him. Somebody comes up and gives you a gift. You're hurting financially. I had a coworker this week. Circumstances have it that her husband's living in Indiana and she's down here. He's coming down this week. This week he was fired. Okay. They bought a plane ticket for four days because that's the time he could get off from work. Okay. They wanted to extend it out to a week. 
the plane fare to change it was just too much. They wanted to be together for that week to sort out where things were going, whether she was planning to move up there this summer, but they were planning whether he would come here now, come back here, um, she would go there. And the extra time would help him maybe look for a job, whatever. But their finances would not allow them to do that. Somebody came along and said, here's an extra hundred dollars to pay for the airfare change. Just out of the blue, you know, they heard the story and they says, here, let us pay that for you. We'd be thankful for that gift. Oh my gosh, I got the hundred dollars and, and I'm excited because I got that hundred dollars. Paul got that hundred dollars but he wasn't ex excited as much for the gift as he was for the love and the concern that it showed to him that the Philippian church had. Philippian church had that, that love and concern that they would go out and, and support him financially. He was more excited about that than he was the money. Now remember, in the Roman prisons, you had to still take care of yourself. You still had to feed yourself. You still, so you were dependent on people outside um, to bring that in, to bring in the money. So he received it, and he was excited. Paul was not detached from people, nor from his feelings. He still loved people dearly, and he's not afraid to show it. And in verse 13, where it says, I can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens me, it clearly shows that Paul did not mean this in the sense of self-sufficiency, that the Stoics use this word, but he affirms the sufficiency that's in Christ. And neither does the contentment mean complacency the opposite. As Christians, we can work to better our circumstances. We don't have to just be content in our circumstances. The Bible <clears throat> stresses that hard work and the rewards that come from it are fine as long as it's not to free us, as long as we're not free from greed. In I really got to figure out my PowerPoints, Brian. <laughs> you got to help me to figure out what font size I need to put on here. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 7, verse 21, were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can, gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. The contentment that Paul is, is kind of showing for us in this passage doesn't mean we cannot work to better ourselves. The bond servant or the slavery of that day would be more akin to indentured servants. If we think through our history books when we were um, in school, people came over to America that could not afford it and became indentured servants. They became slaves, if you will, to the people that paid for it. And they could buy their way out, unlike a true slave. And that's what Paul's saying, is if you are an indentured servant when you were called, called to be a Christian, don't be concerned about it. Just go ahead and live through it. However, if you can work your way out of it, do it. Avail yourself of that opportunity. So it's not complacency that Paul is talking about here when he uses the phrase contentment. <clears throat> Use your sound judgment. Wait patiently on the Lord. If you're in a situation that needs to be changed, it's okay with God for you to strive to change it as long as you are happy, as long as you are content where God puts you, maybe it's a situation where 
you need to improve your job. You feel like where I'm at right now is not going to um, be sufficient. It's okay to go back to school. It's okay to go back and learn a trade. <coughs> it's okay just to stay in the position you are with another employer and bettering yourself. As long as we do so with submission to the will of God. But what does contentment mean? Definition I've come here to find. It is an inner, so, inner sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that He is in control of all that happens to us. Contentment. Not necessarily happiness. Not necessarily joy. Not necessarily emotional high. But the inner sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that He is in control of all that happens. Laying the cares back on Him. <coughs> it means having our focus on the kingdom of God and serving Him and not on the love of money, the love of things, the love of a new marriage, the love of a new house, or the love of a new pair of shoes. But we also seek to use it for his purpose by being generous. <clears throat> if he takes our riches, <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 6 and 6, 7, if he takes our riches, our joy remains steady because we're fixed on him. The verse, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we bought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. That is what that sense of rest and that sense of peace. No matter what God gives us, hey guys, this is not easy. This is not easy stuff psychologically, emotionally. But if you're doing well and you're wiped out, if we're content in the Lord, we can live through it. We can continue to trust Him. It means not being battered around by those difficult situations because our life is centered on our relationship with Jesus. So no matter what happens, no matter what others do to us, we have a steady assurance that the Lord is with us and the Lord is for us and the Lord will not forsake us. And the opposite of that is true. If all of a sudden we win that lottery, everything's going well, we're still steady in the Lord. We don't put the Lord behind, which is often the case. You start a business, it explodes and it does well, and now you've got, um, you know, you've got tons of money rolling in and fame and fortune, and you kind of forget that it wasn't you that did it, but God that provided that basis. So, we look at contentment. How do we go ahead and acquire it? We're going to look a little bit in this passage of um, how Paul kind of lays out. The secret for contentment in this passage, as I see it, is that every situation is to be focused on the Lord. The Lord is our sovereign, the Lord is our savior, and the Lord is our sufficient one. He's the sovereign one. The one who we submit to. We talk over and over and over again here at Friendship Grace Brethren about God being in control, God being sovereign over us. And we need to trust in Him. If I know Him in these ways as Paul did, I'll know contentment. Paul mentions in the first verse of this passage, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. 
The word revived kind of gives that connotation of a flower blooming in spring. I know we don't really have spring um, here in Fort Myers. But, or the leaf opening up, revived, to be renewed, to come through again. And he's quick to add that they always had been concerned for them, for him, but they lacked opportunity. It wasn't just, oh man, great, thanks for the gift. But guys, your love for me, you just showed me over again, you revived it, but you didn't have opportunity. Now, what opportunity? We really don't know what he meant by that. Could be that they did not have the funds. It could be that they didn't have a messenger, somebody to run to take it. I mean, it's not like today when we hit our bank account, we go to Zelle, boom, it's in their checking account. It's my daughter and I, we do that. Dad, can I borrow? Okay. 30 seconds later, while we're still on the phone, it's in her bank account with Zelle. It's not like they had that. Somebody had to take that gift and ride days and days, maybe weeks, to get to Rome to give it to Paul. We don't know the circumstances, but whatever the reason, God knew, or Paul knew that God was in control, that God knew his need and God would supply or not supply as he saw fit. Paul was subject to the sovereign God in the most practical need and area of his financial support. Now, I don't think Paul ever publicly went out and talked about his financial needs. There's no record of it. But here he is in prison, unable to pursue his work. He couldn't make tents. Um, he was in a tight spot. Verse 14, that trouble, that affliction, that pressure. He wrote a number of letters to the various churches encouraging them and instructing them. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, all written in prison. He asked for prayer, for boldness for faithfulness, and he trusted and, and submitted to the sovereignty of God to provide his needs. In those letters, he didn't say, hey guys, I'm hurting, send me some money, would you please? I'm hungry here, and I gotta provide my own food. He prayed for boldness. He prayed that his witness would be, um, would be there and he trusted God as their sovereign. Everything was under control. He didn't grumble, he didn't panic, but he submitted to God's control. Notice that Paul had learned to be content in all conditions, what we talked about briefly. It, to come, it didn't come naturally to him. It wasn't an instantaneous transformation. It's not like Paul's sitting there and all of a sudden, Oh man, I'm content. I really don't care. It's not complacency. Um, but it says here that everything, major and minor, is under God's control. Paul said, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. Both. I knew good times. I knew bad times. There's an evangelist from the 1800s by the name of George Mueller. Many of you have heard of George Mueller. He took very serious the idea of being content and trusting in the sovereignty of God. At one point, him and his wife made the decision that they really didn't care about their um, finances, and they gave it all over to ministry. And he started an orphanage. They, um, they put all their money into it. And he was firmly committed to this concept of not making his financial needs known to anyone. He wasn't the televangelist, send me, send me, send me, send me. You know, I need this, I need this. He did not ever mentioned finances and the needs that they had. 
One day, February 8th, 1842 to be exact, he realized that they were now out of food. And he had grown this from the one orphanage to now where he had five places of orphanages because he, he didn't have enough room. He had like, I think, I think I read he had like about 200 children under his care. And he realized that that day's meals were the last that they had. They had no money to buy their usual bread, their new, usual milk, or even the coal to heat the houses. And he noted in his journal that if God did not send help before nine the next morning, his name would be dishonored. The next morning, Mueller woke up and he went to the orphanages early to see how God would meet their need. He hadn't gone out on the road with a sign, hungry, you know, with kids need help. He just prayed, he trusted God. So he went there and he discovered that the need had already been met. A Christian businessman walked past the orphanage and he walked about a half a mile past when God laid on his heart, you know, they might need something. I need to give a gift to that orphanage. He goes, I'm going to do that on the way home. And the businessman said he was pressed on God and he turned around right then and walked back and gave it. That was the gift that they needed that would take them now through two days. That's trusting in the sovereign God. Mueller was content. He wasn't panicked. He wasn't stressed. He was content in his prayer knowing that God's the sovereign. Whether the crisis is small, whether the crisis is major, whether the crisis is life-threatening, in order for us to have contentment, the spiritual contentment that Paul talks about, we need to trust in God as the sovereign, that God is in control. Hard to do. Hard to do. The second part is that contentment comes from focusing on the Lord as Savior, the one whom I serve. The reason Paul knew that God would meet his basic need was that Jesus had promised, very small print he promised, Humble yourself, therefore. Hunger yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And we're missing a slide there. Um, the slide was from Matthew. The verse, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And I apologize for missing that slide. <clears throat> this refers to all the things. If you look before that in the passage of Scripture, it talked about food and drink and clothing. All these things that the Savior has promised us will be added to you if we seek his kingdom. Jesus was teaching that if we focus on serving him and growing in righteousness, that God will take care of all of our basic material needs. In the context, he's talking about how to be free from anxiety, how to be content in the soul. If our focus is on our Savior, and on doing what he called us to do, which includes growing in personal holiness, he'll be content. He'll provide the content to our heart. Take a notice. God promises to meet our needs, not our greeds. That's where we can be content. Our needs are going to be felt. I met. We're going to have food. We're going to have clothing. We're going to have some sort of shelter in some way. Most of us living in America have far more than our needs. 
Do we need air conditioning? Don't say yes, Nancy. We want it, but we don't need it. And beyond that, do we need to have a fan circulating that air even when it's 30 degrees out? Don't say yes, Elaine. <laughs> we need to remember that supplying our needs can be different in different societies, in different areas in the world. Here in America, we've got it really good. Esther, you spent time in Haiti. God provided needs. But we would be struggling here in America if that's the situation that God had us living in day by day by day. If you had to eat mystery meat or whatever you guys called it <laughs> every day. I heard, I've read a story. Um, the rabbi and the goat. It was a Hungarian Jewish man who was really frustrated because there were um, nine people living in one room. Now God meets the need sometimes. You got shelter, but there's nine of you packed into one room. So he went to his rabbi. <clears throat> he goes, Rabbi, there's nine of us living in one room. What can we do about it? Rabbi says, take your goat into the room with you. Huh? Do as I say and come back to me in a week. A week later, the man returned. And he looked more distraught than ever. And he says, we can't stand it. The goat is filthy and dirty and smelly. Rabbi says, go home and take your goat back outside and come back and see me in a week. A week later, the man returned. He was all excited and rainy. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Life is great. We enjoy every minute of it now that there's no goat in the house with all nine of us. It's all about perspective. <laughs> Our situations, when we go in and grumble and complain about them versus what is really real. Guys, I am chief among those that grumble and complain about things in life and the situations that God has us go through. And I've got a great wife who quite often remembers and reminds me, Chuck, God's in control. She says that quite often to me. The point is, if we live for our own self and our own pleasure, we'll not know God's contentment. But if we follow what Paul is saying and serve the Savior, we will get that contentment. Whether it's little or much, serving God with our money, with our possessions, with our heart, is the way to contentment. The Savior has made the way for our future. And that future is eternal. And that's got to be a great contentment to us. Also now, the sufficient one. Contentment comes from focusing on the Lord as the sufficient one, whom I must trust. Paul says he learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and having, having suffering. He's had it from each side. And he ends that with, I can do all things in him who continually infuses me with strength. And that's a kind of a, a literal rendering of that verse. The all-sufficient indwelling Christ was Paul's source of strength and contentment. And since Christ cannot be taken from the believer, eternal life, we can lean on him in every situation, no matter how trying. Now notice, there's no need to learn about not only how to get along in times of need, but how to live in times of abundance. We're tempted in times of abundance to take our eyes off the Lord 
and grow weary. weary. <clears throat> That's why we need a trusting heart. When we're in need, we need to trust God. When we're in times of plenty, we need to have a thankful heart. Paul says here in Philippians 4, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am being again to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. Guys, Paul was bought low. Has anybody in your memory or your reading ever been bought lower than Paul? Shipwrecked three times. I mean, that's the unsinkable Molly Brown. I mean, she only did it once. Paul did it three times. Paul's in prison. Falsely accused. Facing death. He's been bought low. But yet, he's thanking God with a thankful heart for when things go great. He acknowledges his gratitude for the provision that God's brought to him. He's thanking God for the daily bread that he gets. In all things, in all things, by that Paul means he can do everything that God called him to do in his service for the kingdom. He can obey God. He can live in holiness, in thought, holiness in word, holiness in deed. He can ask for provisions needed to carry out the work and expect God to answer. We can do the same thing. Show of hands. Who would be afraid of public speaking? Who would be afraid to stick? Brian, put that hand down. Okay? All right. If God called you to stand up in public and to speak, he'd take care of the need of letting you be able to do it. He did it with Aaron back in the Old Testament. Mr. Stutterer became Moses' mouthpiece. For me, you know what one of my biggest fears is? The telephone. I hate calling people on the phone, whether it's just even to get some simple information. You know, do you have such and such in stock? I hate that. That's I get <clears throat> when I do that. It sounds irrational. Just as for me, who I have no problems with public speaking, thinks it's irrational for somebody not to be willing to get up here and talk. But if God called me to be a telephone evangelist, he would give me what I need to get through it. He would give me the sufficiency if I trusted him to do that. If he gave you the heart to give bunches of money to, whoa, never mind. <laughs> to a ministry, he'd give you the resources if it was his calling. Paul says, God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency or contentment in everything, that you may have an abundance for every good deed. That's what we were just talking about. And notice the balance that God's putting on this. When we come to this verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We oftentimes center upon the human responsibility. I, I, I. I can do all things. We only take that first half. I can do all things. And you end up burning out because you cannot do all things by yourself. Others put too much emphasis on the 
through him who strengthens me. And they want to be complacent and sit around and just wait for it to happen. And God, <clears throat> through Paul, talks about the correct balance is that I do it, but I do it by, con by constant dependence on the power of God. It's the two things together. It's in Christ. We use the translated word through as the connotation of in Christ. You know, why we're in him, why we're in that relationship with him and trusting him, that's where it, um, where it comes <clears throat> to be. Paul is saying that because his relationship of union with Christ the all-sufficient Christ, that he can do whatever the Lord calls him to do. He can be content to know that he's there to, that Christ is there to help him through. There's a story. It's called a legend. I asked Rich about this story last week, and both him and I can only find where it's a legend. So we don't know if this story is true or not. Okay? But think about it. Think about what it is. The legend says that a wealthy merchant during Paul's day had heard about the apostle and been so fascinated and determined to see him and to meet him. So when passing through Rome, he got in touch with Timothy and arranged for an interview with Paul while he was still in prison. Stepping inside his cell, the merchant was surprised to find the apostle looking rather old and physically frail. But he felt at once the strength, the serenity, the magnetism, the contentment of the man who relied on Christ as his all in all. They talked for some time, and finally the merchant left. And outside the cell, he said to Timothy, What's the secret of this man's power? I've never seen anything like it. Did you not guess? Timothy said. Paul is in love. Merchant looked kind of puzzled. In love? He says, yes. Paul is in love with Jesus Christ. The merchant looked even more bewildered. That's it? Yes, Timothy. Timothy smiled and said, that's everything. To be content is to be in love with Jesus. Not to love him, but to be in love. I think we all understand the difference of that connotation. So the secret of contentment as laid out here as I see it in the scripture is that we need to, like Paul says, to be captivated by Christ as the sovereign whom we submit to, the savior whom we serve, and the sufficient one whom I trust in every situation. Father, we pray that you give us contentment in our lives, that we put ourselves away, that we look to you that we don't get flustered in times of need, that we don't abandon you in times of, of want or in times of, of abundance. But Lord, let us not look just to be happy in you, not to be joyful, but to be content, to sit back, lay back and say, ah, oh, this is... Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.